Right. Say um, a couple of words about my title image. Clearly, it's uh, it's a depiction of landscape of a sort. It also includes within it a narrative. There's a journey taking place, and you could ask all kinds of questions. Who are they? Where have they come from? Where are they going? Which of those delightful little places are they going to spend the night? Um, but uh, it's, it, it, it also actually raises questions of scale, incidentally, because the original drawing is tiny, and I've blown it up onto the screen, which is really unfair to the artist. Um, just in the way that enlarging a map is unfair to the cartographer. Um, I'm also both amused and alarmed by the idea of going downhill at the beginning of my presentation, especially as the guy seems to be steering perilously close to the wrong side of the road. But that again is probably um, to do with um, mucking about with the scale. Those of you who are regular attendees at CIFA conferences may have heard me banging on about, I'm um, talking on this subject before. In fact, I did wonder whether anyone would notice if I simply repeated the paper that I gave at Oxford in 2012, which was, if I remember rightly, a retread of a paper I'd given somewhere else in 2008. But in fact, things have moved on from there, in some respects at least. So I want to uh, discuss three points about um, the strengths and pitfalls of developing technologies, the relationship between invasive and non-invasive approaches, and a question of where do we go from here? This arises from my continuing puzzlement about why, although some of the speakers earlier today have gone some way to answering this, why non-invasive landscape approaches are not adequately taught in archaeology departments, why they are not more routinely applied in commercial archaeology, and in general why they seem undervalued in the discipline. Of course the picture is not entirely bleak, and we have, as I say, heard this afternoon some examples which might answer my questions. But these are, it seems to me, the exception rather than the rule. We've been spoilt by the rapid development of technology over the past few years. So we have ground penetrating radar, LIDAR, global navigation satellite systems, and now structure from motion in particular all backed up by massively increased computer power and these have in some ways transformed what is possible for us. These are genuinely positive developments. I'm now even prepared to admit that LIDAR is a useful tool in some circumstances. This is Vespasian's camp which I spent last winter surveying um, and I got most of these internal features, including this very slight linchet here, but I didn't see these features which you may just be able to make out in this area here. I'm kind of not too apologetic about it because that's what the ground conditions are like, so I'm not surprised that I didn't see them, perhaps. But I am forced to repeat what I've said so many times before, that these exciting new tools have to be used thoughtfully and they have to be used properly. They should not be used where there are better and often cheaper alternatives, and they should not be used in a half-baked fashion by people who do not fully understand them. Laser scanning is another new development that has genuine uses in recording and illustrating buildings, portable artefacts and especially low relief carvings or slight tooling marks as was demonstrated brilliantly at Stonehenge within the last two or three years. 
But there is a worrying propensity for the use of laser scanning in recording ground surface, which it cannot do in any useful way, and certainly not in any cost-effective way. In my abstract, I mentioned that some new technologies, and I was thinking of remote systems, aerial photography and more powerful geophysical techniques principally, privilege, privilege ploughed levelled remains over upstanding, well-preserved sites. There is nothing wrong, of course, with discovering buried archaeology, the hidden landscape. In fact, it is vital to improving our understanding. But it is rather absurd to leave islands of well-preserved archaeological remains unrecorded in the midst of a sea of crop marks and anomalies. And Biggles Wade Common is my constant companion uh, in thinking of this. The area of the common, which is this sort of horseshoe-shaped area of access land around the north of Biggles Wade, is stuffed full of really rather interesting, potentially, earthworks, and yet hardly any of them have been recorded in any way at all. And yet the surrounding areas, which are ploughed to destruction, almost, are full of well-recorded crop marks, etc. Now, technological surveying approaches often lead to vast point clouds, which apparently impresses some people, but it is all too often unintelligent data, and the interpretation is forgotten or rushed. This is partly because it's very often difficult or impossible to develop interpretation from remotely, remotely sensed data alone. LIDAR and even aerial photographs can give a misleading view, and there is no substitute for the field visit. Now, this is not the time to enter into the muddy boots debate, in which some academic archaeologists equate fieldwork with empiricism in some bizarre parody of traditional archaeological fieldwork. <laughs> but such academically snobbish attitudes may account for the low priority accorded to field techniques in their pedagogy. Academics, of course, wear golden boots. <laughs> A traditional survey plan, such as this one of Tennyson Down on the Isle of Wight, often belittled now and characterised as inadequate, carries interpretation within it. Though two-dimensional in spatial terms, it conveys the dimension of time, which is something that is supposed to interest us as archaeologists. This emphasises an important aspect of landscape archaeology, to me one of the most important aspects, the fundamentally non-period specific basis of the discipline. The landscape archaeologist is not interested only in the prehistoric, the medieval or the 20th century, which are represented in this plan, but in how all of these combine to give us the landscape that we see and inhabit today. And this is what I mean by narrative-based analysis. And I am incidentally aware that there are alternatives to narrative. I've seen Peter Greenaway films. But I like narrative, and I find it a useful way of understanding the world. Now, to move on briefly to uh, invasive approaches. Seems to me that the results of excavation are sometimes privileged over those of other methods, which are often characterised as prospection and nothing more. I want to argue here with a short case study, which I'll come to in a minute, that non-invasive fieldwork and research can lead to radical new interpretation. However, I also want to raise a question in passing about the perceived hierarchy of excavated evidence as opposed to survey or non-invasive evidence. It very often happens that aerial photography or geophysical survey, or indeed earthwork survey, show features which are then excavated and nothing is found. The assumption always seems to be that it is the non-invasive or remote sensing techniques that are wrong and that the excavation has proved that the feature does not exist. Some even use that, in this case, horrible phrase, ground-truthing, in this circumstance. 
Yet we all know that it is possible for excavators to dig through features without seeing them. There may even be some people in this room big enough to admit to having done that. I know I have. It is also, of course, possible for excavators to invent features which don't exist, but that's another story. We need an admission that it is possible that some things may elude the vigilance of the digger, and that what is seen in a hole in the ground is not necessarily more true than what is seen on a geophysical plot, an aerial photograph, or indeed as a physical feature on the ground surface. Now, I was going to say another thing about excavation, and I'd, I'd forgotten to include it, but one of the papers in this morning's session reminded me, and it's something that's come up a couple of times in papers this afternoon as well. I had a quotation from Dominic Powelsland, which unfortunately I haven't brought with me, but he was saying in, in, in essence, it's really important for the excavator to stand on, his, on the side of his trench and look out into the landscape. And I'm sort of prepared to give Dominic 7 out of 10 for that remark. Of course, it'd be a damn sight better to stand and look out into the landscape before digging a bloody hole in the first place. Anyway, on to my case study, Tintagel, uh, a, 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 a site which has been in the news somewhat recently for unfortunate reasons. But leaving that aside, um, what I want to look at is three particularly enigmatic features on this very enigmatic site. We have, on Tintagel Island, a garden which is widely accepted to be medieval in origin, a chapel, which is not within the castle, but stuck up there on the edge of the plateau in a rather strange location, and a tunnel or underground cavern of some sort, man-made and again generally accepted to be of medieval date. Now, the garden has been... It has been pointed out by um, Peter Rose um, and other scholars even before that, might fit very nicely with the legend of Tristan and Isult, which, which is in, in, in many aspects, many episodes within the story of Tristan and Isult take place at Tintagel. So it's no great leap of the imagination to suggest that the garden created in the medieval period at Tintagel was supposed to be a reflection, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, a reflection of, of this part of the story, where Tristan and Isult meet uh, at night in the garden, uh, and Isult's husband, King Mark, <coughs> is hiding in a tree uh, to overhear their conversation, their adulterous conversation. But Tristan and his yacht see his reflection in the water and know to be careful. So we have the idea, therefore, that the garden might be associated with that legend. Now the chapel, and this is, uh, I hope you can see this structure from motion uh, image uh, of, of the chapel here is placed right on the edge of the plateau and above this very steep drop down to the east. Now another key element of the story of Tristan and Isult is the point where Tristan, being held captive, is being taken back to the castle and he passes a chapel and he begs his captors to let him go into the chapel to pray, pointing out to them that there's only one door so he can't escape. So the captors, being the usual sort of goons that you get in these things, allow him to go into the chapel to pray, and he promptly jumps through the east window, down the cliff, and escapes. Now that seems to me to explain the enigma of why the chapel at Tintagel is built just where it is, because it is representing the chapel of the story of Tristan and Isild. And then finally... Uh, we can come to the underground cavern, which to me is the clincher, because another important episode, or several important episodes perhaps, in the story of Tristan and Isult, take place in an underground chamber, a sort of 
lover's uh, lover's cavern, uh, whatever you, whatever um, the word is. But Tristan and Isolde spend a long time in a cave. The explanation that which you will see on site at the moment is that this is a larder. Now that's pretty desperate. Um, uh, I think it makes a much better lover's hiding place. So that's a rather sort of uh, unusual, perhaps, case study. But you can, you can do that kind of level of interpretation from field evidence very, very <coughs> straightforwardly. And it's something we do all the time. This is an example, but, it, but it's something that we've... It's, it's, it's a technique that we've developed over the years and, and that I'm worried that we're going to lose as we lose personnel and staff and experienced people from organisations like Historic England, but from many other organisations as well, local authorities and, and, and so on and so forth. So the question arises, where do we go from here? Um, and I asked this question in different forms in those previous presentations in 2008 and 2012 um, and sadly I think this is one area where little progress has been made the key must lie in training and career development and we've heard from Cara um, already uh, this afternoon about that and how it works and perhaps got something of a flavour of it from Andrew as well so two presentations this afternoon about how professional placements with non-invasive survey teams can develop individual skills and expertise. But of course the problem is that such placements can only benefit a very small handful of people. Training courses, um, of which we run as many as we possibly can, need to be of some duration if they are to inculcate even the most basic skills and understanding. And yet we are in a climate in which few have the luxury of being able to spend three days, let alone a whole week, on a training course. Um, and this is particularly true perhaps of curatorial archaeologists in local authority posts, posts who are particularly hard pressed both in terms of funding and in terms of time. And yet, arguably, it is the curators that we need to target most for such training, as I argued in those previous conferences, because they set the briefs for archaeological work in the commercial sector, and they, above all, need to understand the value of non-invasive techniques and where those techniques can be best employed. Recent attempts to run landscape survey and investigation courses have stumbled on difficulties of recruitment. Courses have been cancelled for lack of interest or have run at a loss. This might only be due to inadequate publicity, but it might indicate a more fundamental or more fundamental problems, such as genuine lack of interest. I hope not. One positive development is the formation of the Landscape Survey Group. It is early days yet, it's only been running for a couple of years, but one of the stated aims of the group is to develop training initiatives to pass on the skills and experience of a rapidly ageing and dwindling band of landscape investigators to a new generation. This might be done via a combination of formal courses, field trips, e-learning packages, but it must be tailored to the needs and resources of the recipients, and that represents a challenge which we must and will address. Thank you.